you know, you want to be hungry. Um, you know, you want to be humble. Anybody that worked at Under Armour will laugh because we had banners that hung up everywhere that said humble and hungry. Um, and, but you know, that's really what you needed, especially in a, in a build your personal brand environment or in a startup environment. Like you got to be looking for, for every opportunity and every advantage, um, and re- really be, you can be aggressive and, and be humble and, and still have everybody, you know, really love what you're doing. Um, you know, and I see some people in building their personal brand, they kind of, you know, go the pro wrestler route. Like who's the, who's the heel? Like, is this the guy nobody's going to like? Cause he's super brash and cocky. And, you know, sometimes you gotta be really good to, to, <laughs> to succeed with that, you know, and that's right. People I think that right now, but, um, you know, it, it's not for everybody. And, and most of our guys in this space are, you know, they, they, you know, have a, I grew up a, a simpler life mm-hmm. and were taught a lot of the right things. And, you know, had, had strict parents with, with rules in place and, and, you know, they understand how to go about it. So, you know, in the fishing space, there's not many that you come across that rub you the wrong way. Hey, y'all. If you spend any time at all in the outdoors, you've probably noticed the Hook Performance Fishing brand of apparel. It's called, it's spelled H-U-K. And the brand was launched in 2014. And in a very short period of time, like by the end of the fishing season in 2015, they were everywhere. The brand was actually created by a couple of business people who left Under Armour to create Marilana Outdoor the parent company of the Hook Performance Fishing brand, as well as Nomad Outdoor, which is hunting apparel. Today on the Fishing Business Podcast, we're lucky enough to get to spend some time with one of those founders of Hook Performance Fishing, who also was the CEO, Ben Verner. Ben grew Hook into a powerhouse, and he's now gone on to start a couple of other businesses, including another apparel brand called Revolution, and also an agency called Critical Mass Brands, which helps bring outdoor products to market. Ben is a passionate outdoorsman. He absolutely loves to fish and hunt and just be outside. He's the real deal when it comes to that, and he's managed to turn his passion into several successful businesses. Ben is really a visionary, as you might imagine, and just brilliant about strategy and how to leverage what sets a brand apart. I thought it would be helpful for you guys to learn from Ben because as aspiring pro athletes or someone who's looking to make a name for themselves in the outdoor space somehow, you also need to set yourself apart and have a strategy about your business. So listen to this conversation with an open mind and everywhere Ben talks about a brand or a business, insert your name instead. Think of how you can really learn from what Ben did and put it into action in your own business or life and turn your passion into a profitable business. All right, Ben Ver, I haven't seen you in a little while. It's it's been a it's been a minute, and um, I know you're doing some new things, some really cool things, and I can't wait to dig into all of that. But before we do, for the people that are out there listening to this who may not know exactly who you are, can you talk a little bit about your background and how what you're doing now, and sort of how that that all unfolded? Sure. Um, you know, I. I I guess I came to meet you through, through the hook brand, uh, which we launched back in 2014. And that was really just a result of my passion for, for the fishing business and, and kind of cut my teeth at Under Armour, um, you know, back in the day when it was, you know, just really riding a rocket ship and, you know, elevated a fishing business plan several times. Um, and it was just, there was so much low hanging fruit around there. It just made a lot more sense to invest in international business and basketball and all these other growth categories and they just wouldn't chase it. And I just knew like the, the opportunity that was there with, um, you know, the performance fabrics and the sun protection, and it was really coming over to the bass world. Um, versus, you know, it only kind of been on the flats down in Florida that, that people were really embracing it. And you started to see the young guys wearing the sun gloves and the buffs and, you know, the right. timing was just perfect. Um, so you got a little frustrated. We, we took a little splinter cell with myself and, and some of the sales team and, um, you know, off we went and we found it hook and not many people can say their first order came from Cabela's. Uh, wow. so by having all the relationships and the know-how and, um, you know, really got every meeting we ever wanted, including, you know, Bassmaster, even pre-launch, mm-hmm. um, you know, Kevin, Gerald, Skeet, all those guys just understood. They saw the same opportunity and really made it this special right out of the gate. And, um, 
you know, learned a lot. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> you know, before you move on, I want to tell you, and I've told you this before when it was happening, but I was astounded to see, I swear, I think it was in the space of one season that we mm-hmm. started the season and Hook was there and, and, and activating at the events. And by the end of that season, when we were in a totally different part of the country and all of a sudden all the fans had on, they came in Hook uh, apparel. So you had yeah. market penetration so quick. It was, it was astonishing. It really was, I think. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, we, we, I had looked at it for so long that, you know, I mean, the, the business plan was five years old. It was just do this, do this, do this. Here's the order. Here's how you execute it. And that's what we did. And it was, you know, nobody really, nobody really had apparel deals from a sponsor perspective. Like we were able to just kind of go in and get whoever we wanted. And then, you know, I think it's when you do everything right, like the content was on point, the product is unique and different. And we, we came with this young, fast point of view and you know, all these things kind of work together. And, um, you know, it, it worked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it, that's something I talk about a lot now is like, it's the kind of that confluence of all those things. Mm-hmm. is really where you can make something special versus, you know, there's a lot of people that have good products or there's a lot of people that have good marketing and there's some people that have, you know, just the pieces of it. But when you have it all, you yeah, know, it's, it's almost unstoppable. And that's, that's really what happened. And so now, and now you're taking all of that that you just described into a new business, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, we did a big private equity deal on the, on the hook side and, you know, I sat, dutifully set out my non-compete and um, you know, really started looking at different opportunities and how do you, you know, take a similar opportunity that we saw with Hook, which is how do you be you know, potentially younger and faster in a big market, right? So Hook came out, it was, you know, it was Columbia, it was Sims, it was Under Armour, but um, you know, they've been around a while and mm-hmm. nobody's really going after that younger person. So um, new brand is uh, it's gonna be called Revolution, uh, of course, spelled in a quirky way. Uh, yes, of course. And, um, you know, same thing. So a large addressable outdoor market, you know, Patagonia, Columbia, North Face, all those guys, they're just, they're too big to be young and cool and fast. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that's, that's going to be what revolution is. And that's and your sweet it, spot, right? Does that? Yeah. Yeah. I think as long as I can be young and cool, that's yeah. what I'm doing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but, yeah, it's a little different. I think as you age, you, you stop being able to sell to yourself. So it's, you got to be yeah. humble and realize you're not the guy anymore, but That's right. so far I've been able to hold on to it. And then also there's uh, your other, your other brand, Critical Mass. Yeah. So what we've done is, you know, kind of going through launching revolution during this COVID environment has been tough to say the least. I mean, we're closing financing on March 23rd. I mean, mm-hmm. that was like the kind of the peak of the panic. Um, so as that, you know, you just kind of look at it and say, all right, well, let's get some more irons in the fire to make sure that we've got everything we need to launch this correctly. Um, but we also have a great team. Um, you know, most of them are from the hook side of things. And I want to make sure I keep them busy. And what started to happen is we started to do some projects for, for other people in the space. And it quickly became apparent to me that there was, there was an opportunity there. The world is beginning to embrace virtual offices and, and working remotely. Um, you know, the e-com side of the business and fishing specifically exploded during COVID. Fishing is the, the major winner, hands down. Yeah, of, absolutely. Of, of, the, uh, of kind of what we've been going through. And, you know, it just, you know, I did some work with Sims. I did, you know, a lot of really cool things, but then it started to be very apparent. There's a lot of people out there that are in a similar position to what I'm in, where I was with Hook, but they didn't have that nudge or the, or the ability to make the jump. And whether it's a, you know, they got a small $2 million website that's, you know, you might be making money, you might not, but it's, it's really fun to operate or you have a really cool idea that, you just don't know how to get it to market. You don't have the connections, you know, all that stuff that we had. Um, and what critical mass does is the, the idea of is, is, is kind of strength in numbers, right? So you, mm-hmm. you leverage the shared back end. Like I said, the confluence of all those perfect things, and we're able to pull together a package that makes it, you know, hopefully irresistible from a, you know, product brand perspective. 
And by, you know, kind of everybody lumping together, we're able to leverage acquisition costs and we're, we're kind of piggybacking websites and photo shoots. So, you know, oh, that's smart. Cost maybe $50,000 cost you 10 because we're doing it with five partners. Yeah. And it's making it really easy for people to get to market, um, you know, in a way that, that I don't believe they could before it was, you know, I had to wait for Plano to buy you or, you know, one of those big guys to either license some technology or get bought. And, and then you kind of give up the dream a little bit. This is a good way to, to kind of stay in control, not sell your soul and, and, you know, take your, your dream to market, I guess. Right. And are you helping people with distribution or marketing or, or all of that? Are, are you, are you just sort of. Uh, right. the... And so it started as um, a little bit more of a, a kind of an a la carte, like we can, you know, let's do some marketing. Let's talk about brand. Let me look at product. Um, and what it's really become is, as I'm been able to kind of pick and choose the ones that we're able to do all of it to make sure it works. And I think that's where some of my apprehension is with some clients is just, you know, if, if we can't do the whole thing, I, I don't know if, if it's going to get there. Mm -hmm. So by being able to take the whole thing on and, um, you know, really leverage all the back end and do it pretty efficiently, it's, it's really win-win. And, and that's what we're trying to focus on is, you know, how do we align everything strategically so that, you know, you, your content's great, your brand looks fantastic, your e comms going well, and then you can start talking about distribution. And, um, you know, the world's changing. So I think a lot of people come in with, uh, you know, I want that $10 million order from Bass Pro. I'm like, right. Not sure you do. Yeah. Um, just because it's the, the working capital stress it puts on you. you right. Know, for the most part, it's all of a sudden you got to come up with five million bucks to build that stuff. And, and you got to fulfill the order. <laughs> yes. Right. So, you know, I was looking at your LinkedIn profile, you know, I've known you for a long time, but kind of just kind of dug in a little bit. And it seems like from the way it is on LinkedIn, that you kind of see yourself as an operations guy. Whereas I, from working with you, always saw you as a, a like sort of a visionary creative guy. So was I wrong about that? Or is it both? Well, I mean, I was the first finance hired under armor. Right. So that's oh, my, sure. my background finance. Is, is finance. And then I was able to really do anything I wanted there. It was fantastic. So go learn how to build product, design, source it, you know, work with the marketing guys. And really, you know, you had all that kind of come together. And I think by having that picture, what it needs to look like as it goes to the consumer, I think is a, is a difference maker versus, you know, somebody may just have an idea of like, Hey, this is, this is a great product. We should make it in my mind. It's already like, how am I selling it? to the end user 18 months from now. Yeah. And I think by having all that, it, it makes it a little bit easier to package all these things together and get that, you know, that perfect alignment of all these disciplines. Um, so there's definitely some process and some operations that has to go into it. Um, I think for most of the critical mass clients, that's what they need. You know, they don't, they don't need to hire customer service and designers and, and have a warehouse and all these different things. They can leverage what we have there. Um, where we really come in is, you know, I don't know if I coined the phrase, but I talk about defensible market position all the time. So yes, it may be something, maybe something that's already done and, and hooks a great example in that there was, you know, people were putting patterns and camo on things long before hook came around, but we absolutely owned it. And two years later, everybody had it, but we still owned it. And it was a, a very unique aesthetic that you could pick out from 200 yards away on the water, whether you saw a logo or not, you knew it was a hook shirt. And trying to find that and find a way to leverage that strategy with all the customers and clients is, is really where it happens because, you know, there's, there's tons of people that come to you and be like, look, man, I just, I just want to be the next salt life. Yeah. Like, yeah. They, they kind of have that. Yeah. So let's talk about something else. So, you know, what, what can you be the best at? And then how do you defend against competition once you get there uh, is really the most critical thing for building these brands. And it's really fun to, to kind of peel back, all the layers and uh, probably the most fun to do that with was Sims. I mean, you got a 40 year old company that for most people, if you ask who they are, it's fly fishing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have a task of, you know, how do you kind of unshackle that and bring it to the bass and salt market? And, you know, it's a couple of long days in the bunker and just, you know, really thinking a lot of whiteboard work. And, you know, I think we came out with something that, you know, people will see next year. That's, that's super compelling that leverages who they are, which is, you know, they're, they make the best waterproof products in the world because it's all underwater, right? You start with waders, your rainwater's pretty good. Right. That's right. <laughs> right? So totally. Um, well, so just, you know, kind of doing that along the way, um, 
you know, solving for some of the, the older legacy brands. And then, you know, some of these new guys have a great idea and, you know, really cool product. And then I ask them what color it is. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, make it hot pink. Mm-hmm. Everybody will know what it is, right? It's, yeah, it's really right. that simple. Like be, be provocative and, and maybe do something a little unexpected. Um, at least, you know, as simple as, you know, what color is it? And, you know, I think, um, you know, Ducket Rods is a great example. Mm-hmm. I don't know how many years ago, but all of a sudden white rods started showing up everywhere. And, you know, now every rod company has a, a signature color almost. Mm-hmm. seems like we're kind of coming back to black all the time, but you know, that's, it's something you have to do. And it, you know, whether you put a label on it or not, if you could see it at hundred yards that you did it right. That's right. Well, what I, what I hear you say in there through all of that really is that you're really, really good and have a natural ability at strategy. And, um, and I, I think that's, uh, you know, I, most of the people that are listening to this are, are new and up and coming or aspiring uh, anglers, or mm-hmm. they're looking for a job in the outdoors. And I think strategy can that a brand uses can also be translated down to an individual. And that's what I really want to talk to you a little bit more about. I'm going to take a break right now, but when we come back, we're going to get more into that. So you guys stay here, more good stuff coming with Ben. Do you know what your personal brand is? Because everyone has a personal brand. You may not be intentional about it yet, but all that you say or do or write or post contributes to how others perceive you. And that, my friends, is your personal brand. If you want to develop your brand and mean the things you want it to mean, I have a workbook that will help you get started and it's free. You can download my Developing Your Personal Brand Workbook at www.fishingbusinessschool.com slash brand workbook. We're back on the Fishing Business Podcast with Ben Verner from Critical Mass Brands and formerly from Hook, formerly from Under Armour, a guy who has a, a, a really deep background in uh, in business and in the business around the outdoors and, and somebody we can all learn a lot from. Um, and thanks for being here a, a lot, Ben. I really appreciate you taking the time to do it. Um, but one thing that I've really noticed about all the brands you've worked for is that they all have very, very strong defined strategies and and also very defined and strong competitive advantage. So how important is that strategy piece in business? Uh, I mean, I I don't, I I think if you can do it without that, you're lucky, right? And if you do it with it, you're making your own luck, right? So it just really narrows your focus, um, allows you to put all the available capital and horsepower behind you know, the right idea. And so it's not, you don't waste time. Exactly. Exactly. And you don't chase the chase a ghost. Something that's not there. Um, keeps you from, you know, being a little, a little bit me too. We say that a lot in the, in the product world. It's like, yeah, it's just, you know, it's kind of same, same. It's what everybody else has. And some of that you need, it's, you know, it's commodity level product. It's the right price point. It's a lot of volume, but it's not who you are as a brand. And, you know, fortunately in these startup environments, you can really, be strict and, and disciplined with yourself because you don't have this giant line to worry about. It'd be very difficult for a, you know, a Columbia or someone of that nature to say, you know, this is who we are and this is what we're going to focus on. There's, you know, it's a billion dollar company and you're selling yeah. to my grandfather and my kids. Right. Right. When you launch these brands, you can be super narrow. And although, you know, you walk down a dock and there every 60 year old guy was wearing hook, we still marketed to the 18 year old mate or Brandon Politic. It was mm-hmm. it was the young, fast, dynamic guys that that really embody that brand and made everybody else want to wear it. So mm-hmm. I think it's it's having that strategy and what you're going to target. And I think what you market to ends up being those people, but it's also aspirational for everyone else. And uh, certainly learned that from Under Armour. I mean, everybody knew the Protect This House video and the big E with all the muscles and you put the shirt on and, you know, as a guy, you're like, man, my shoulders look good. Like, let's go lift. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of solving that same puddle on the, uh, puzzle on the apparel side, um, is, you know, what, what makes people feel great, look cool. And, you know, it's, it's kind of back to the old Deion Sanders, like, mm-hmm. you know, you look good, you feel good, you feel good, you play good, yeah, <laughs> play right. good, you get paid good. So, so can uh, I it's, ask it's you kind of an inside in all these products? Can I ask you some of an inside question about the apparel business Mm -hmm. as I've always wondered this I was cleaning out my attic last weekend and I found this box that had this um 
I think it was a Patagonia. It was a, it was a fly fishing jacket, waterproof five fly fishing jacket. And I just, and I remembered, I was like, oh my gosh, I wondered where this was. I love this jacket. I probably bought it maybe, maybe in more than 20 years ago. Now it might not still be as waterproof as it was just because it's old, but it, I would certainly wear it, uh, mm-hmm. wear it again. But I think I thought about, I was like, you know, some of these come, they come out with new stuff every year. And it makes you feel like your old stuff's not good enough. And, um, and is that intentional? Do you have to come up out, out with new lines every year because you just can't keep selling the old stuff? And isn't that a lot of pressure to come up with new ideas every year? For sure. That's, you know, that's part of the fun, I think, um, you know, especially when you're selling a big retail, right? They don't, you know, I, I, and when you do something new and innovative, generally everybody follows, right? So you constantly have to be ad- advancing that ball. Um, I think with the, the hook business and Cryptech was a great example. Awesome partnership, three year run, more than you typically see with any pattern, yeah. but we needed to make it so that everybody who bought that now had old stuff. So that's when you launch a new pattern and that's the new aesthetic. And, and all of a sudden it's like, man, like now I got the old stuff. Right. Now I, got, I have to get the new stuff. I'm not cool anymore. So certainly intentional, um, you know, not necessarily planned obsolescence. You don't want the stuff to fall apart, but mm-hmm. new design, new aesthetic and, and, you know, new, new, new every six months is, is kind of what you need to do. And, you know, fire, fire every gun you have. Yeah. And, um, you know, and that really comes down to, you know, like the, the pressure for the ideas. And if you find yourself saving ideas, you're doing it wrong. You know, ah. there's, there's always more. And you're all, like, I continue to be surprised at what we can come up with when we're backed into a corner. Right. And, you know, what I do now is you know, I put myself in that corner a lot just because I know it's going to create like that, you know, the, the creative juices will flow because you, you have no other option. Right. Sounds stressful to me, Ben. I sounds, I would, I don't know if I could, I don't know if I could do it. I, I'll tell I, you what, I, I, I wouldn't want to be in the, on the fashion side of it. Oh yeah. You're really taking some leaps and, you know, thankfully in the outdoors, we follow probably about two years behind. It used to be further, Mm -hmm. Uh, but you can, you can take a lot of uh, direction from what's already a market in the outdoor space. And, you know, we did the best we could to accelerate it. Um, But you know, it's, that's where they're really taking some risk. Right. You know, um, you talked earlier about um, strategy and, and being different while already, while also having the things, you know, the common denominators that all businesses have or certain categories have, you know, the, the people who are listening to this are, are, are people who are trying to establish their own brand, whether mm-hmm. it's to become a professional fisherman or try to get a job. I mean, we're all, we're all managing our brand. Right. And those, as, as you were saying that I was like, you know, this is totally relates to an individual building their brand. How does, how have, how do you think, an, in, an individual can build a strategy for themselves? Oh, I, well, and you can be the best, right? But not everybody can do that. And in this business, you know, it, like, you know, Kevin got paid the best because mm-hmm. he was the best and he, he was, but there's also people that do really well um, being middle of the pack and very interesting, right? And, or have a unique aesthetic. And, um, you know, one of my favorites is, is Chad Pipkins. Like, he, you know, every now and then he'll go on a tear and, and in Gerald's words, kick everybody's ass. Yeah. Um, but like, he never shied away from, from who he was. He's mm-hmm. my kids call him crazy hair, Chad. Like he's, <laughs> you know, he's got blue pants. He's got a, you know, a, a moose up mohawk and, um, he can catch the hell out of small mouth. So yeah. Like that's a perfect example. And and I think a lot of the guys do really well in terms of, you know, branding their boat and their truck and trying to align with the right folks. And I, you know, for that, I just say like, you know, pick a color. You know, yeah. I think some people have done it really well with it. And, and something no one else has. I don't care if you like it or not, but, you know, be different. Wrap your truck in plaid. Who knows? Right. Right. It's, so that when people see that on the road, it's, it stands out and it doesn't necessarily change with title sponsorships or sponsorships. Like that can always be your trick, polka dots, mm-hmm. whatever it may be. Um, and, and then you start to be very recognizable and relatable. And that's, you know, the, the marketing side of it for sure. And then I think it's, you know, professionally in this business, just, you know, know who you are and what you're good at. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. like, a lot of people don't get into the outdoor business to make a lot of money. They do it because they love it. So if, if that's why you're there, just, you know, don't, don't hide from it. 
um, just do it and, and love it. And, you know, if you're not good at something, obviously you, you can try to get better at it, but if you're great at something, just do that 10 times more. And yeah. uh, the, the good things tend to follow. Yeah. You know, really what you're talking about there is cutting through the clutter and, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of thought that goes into cutting through the cut to the clutter in, in marketing your, yourself or your business, mm -hmm. because man, you know, everybody's trying to get your attention. That's something that your, your brand, the brands you've worked with, I don't know if you did it, but I mean, I don't know if you were responsible for it, but they all cut through the clutter and that's a huge advantage in my opinion. Yeah. I think it comes down to, to like I said, it's, it's color and a unique aesthetic, you know, mm -hmm. can you, can you ID it from a hundred yards? even better if it's 200 yards, right? So it's um, down to whatever product it may be. And we had a hunting brand, it's called Nomad. Um, and we picked the brightest color orange you could find, which is, you know, it's a little counterintuitive, but you walk in a store, you can see it a mile away and you see it on TV and in ads, you know, I mean, and we know, um, you know, it, it was a Nomad product. So whether you could see the logo or not, a lot of it's, it's the placement and it's a, some of the, ex, you know, accessory colors and, and some of those things that come into it that, that really make it yours. Right. And, you know, that's where that defensible piece of it comes in. Like, can, can you own the color orange in hunting? Probably not. <laughs> but we combined it with a lot of gray and we, we did some unique things and, and had our own patterns and, and things of that nature that made it defensible. And, mm -hmm. you know, very similar on the hook side, uh, with, with the pattern thing and, and Cryptech and some of the other ones. Um, you know, now I'm doing a little bit different. We move a lot faster. This is, you know, pattern redeveloped. Uh, some of the ones back here are patterns we developed and they're, they're literally designed to splash in and splash out uh -huh. and just move faster and, you know, really not hitching your wagon to something for, for three years. Um, you know, just treat it as a decoration and, and kind of go as fast as you can. Oh my God, your poor wife. I feel sorry for her right now because if you're, if you're, if you're going to, it sounds to me like this is going to be something that, that your, your, your timeline is even more sped up and your new ideas need to come even more quicker. And so, yeah. uh, like I said, uh, it's I the fun sorry. part. Yeah. <laughs> well, the you ideas are easy. That. It's, you know, everybody has those. It's how do you get it to market and then how do you make it go? And that's thankfully, you know, experience and, and, you know, right. lumps of my head from doing it. Um, you know, that, it, it, I, I sleep pretty well knowing yeah. that, you know, there's going to be some level of success, even if you get it moderately wrong. And then you can take that, those data points and then really dial it in. So, yeah. um, but yeah, go fast. You know, I used to work in uh, television uh, programming development. So I would pitch shows and to networks and try for our production company. And I'd have people call me all the time and say, I've got this great idea for a, a TV show. And I'd be like, you know, Honestly, and no offense, but great ideas are a dime a dozen. And, mm -hmm. you know, unless you can, unless you can figure out how to, all the components that make it work, you know, they, you know, they, people would be real, real like, uh, I've got this great idea and I can't show it to you unless you, unless you sign an NDA or I want you to help me develop it with me, not even telling you what the concept is. And I'd always be like, the concept's not the hard part, right? right? The concept's not hard. It's the, all the rest of it's hard. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, you know, that's, that's where the magic happens. And right. That's, that's kind of where, you know, the, the, the idea behind critical mass is just leveraging, you know, the magic part of it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Having done there, it's, it's really nice to be able to point at the scoreboard for sure. Um, and you know, everybody picks up the phone when I call and we've got a great network that, that helps out on absolutely everything because there's confidence and they know we've done it before and they want to be involved on the next one. And that's, you know, it's, you invaluable compared right. to any of the value created or, or money you made on that is, you know, cause you don't know when that next great idea is going to hit you. And when you know that you can get it to market, it's really easy to take action versus, you know, kind of write it on a board or in a notepad and it sits there for years and years and years. And the next thing you know, you're, you're, you're probably a little past when you should have done it and you have a lot of regret. Now you just, just do it. Yeah. Take <laughs> and, action. And you'll see. I mean, it, there's, and with that new model, you can test a lot of things too. And that's, you know, I'm telling a lot of people is like, look, man, this is, this may or may not work. And we're, but we're going to know pretty quick as inexpensively as we can. Right. right. So we we'll get it out there and you'll get a pretty good read right away. Um, whether you need more or less or recalibrate or, and whatever it may be to get to the next level. So um, what I've heard that when underway, I've heard that put is fail fast if you're going to fail. Yeah, right. yeah, I was fortunate to work with the innovation team 
at Under Armour, that was the motto. It was like, we're not going to chase anything that seems like, you know, an unmakeable putt, yeah. <laughs> like, but you got to figure that out as quickly as you can, because in that environment, big business and, and a lot of technology and commitments, and you're traveling around the world. I mean, you can, you can burn through a million bucks fast, mm-hmm. uh, really trying to make something work just because it's a great idea. Um, you know, sometimes it's just better to, to move on to the second or, th- or third option and, and make sure you get to market. And right. it doesn't mean you need to give up on that dream. It's just like, get something else going. Yeah. So that you, you have business and you're gaining the experience for when, when that, you know, real game changer does hit, um, you're ready for it. And sometimes it may not be that your idea failed. It just may be that iteration of the idea failed or. Oh, for sure. You, you, you I say it all the time. So, you know, when we develop a new, new line of apparel, I, it's, I say it's third season, you finally get it right. And for, in the apparel business, you know, you're, you're rotating seasons probably every six months. You know, some guys do it faster. Uh, for online businesses, you can do it really fast. You can have, mm-hmm. you know, quarterly seasons and even faster than that. But you're doing your first and second before you even sell it. So right. you have no feedback. But while you're developing your third, you're selling your first. And that's really where you can kind of take that feedback loop into account and, and really get everything dialed in. So it's even with, I mean, it's funny, if I pulled up the original hook designs, like the the fabrics and the design itself didn't change, but almost everything else did. Really? Yeah. So it was, you know, we were very heavily skewed in t-shirts out of the gate. We thought that was going to be a really great business for us. We had awesome fabric and hats and, you know, we probably ended up having 20 times more t-shirts than we needed and we needed more performance, more performance, more performance. And we had a black camouflage shirt that was just a, just a blob camo. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, outsold everything 10 times. So Crazy. Not many fishing companies sell black. It's no number one yeah. color. So it really, you know, kind of tilted everything on its ear and we just, okay, more of that. And, you know, off we go. How do you account? How do you account, how do you account for that? Colors, but. How do you account for the black selling the, the best? Look cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that's at it's, the end of the day. That's important. Yeah. Well, and, and I hear you. I, I get the question a lot. I was like, what's like, why do you think it worked? And I think our, our commitment to pattern would, is what I think made it work. And it, and it worked because you know, a lot of fishermen are big guys. And by putting a pattern on something, all the lumps, all the chest hair, all the you know, mm-hmm. imperfections kind of, you know, they get washed out in that pattern. I honestly think that's, that's one of the reasons that everybody wore it is because they look good in it or look better than they would have in just a green polyester shirt because they're tough. I mean, you got yeah. to be a young yeah. guy for the most part. And by putting a pattern on it, it we solved a lot of that. Well, um, and but then Lululemon, you know, making a, a woman's butt look great. Like we, we solved for something that made these guys feel really good about themselves and, and said something about who they were in terms of, you know, I'm a fisherman and you meet them out somewhere. You, you knew you had something to talk about. That I love that. And I do, I can't, I do remember being in the hook trailer at an activation one time and seeing a three X performance shirt. And I was like, man, these guys have got, a lot of courage to do a 3x performance shirt and 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 I was about to say that might be why black sold you know sold well too because there's a reason why us ladies always wear black right. because it right. hides a lot of imperfections <laughs> <For sure. laughs> but you talked about uh you know the importance of being able to you know not just having a good idea but but getting it executed and and having the system in place to that you can make a call and somebody will answer. And and a lot of that's because you're Ben, but Mm -hmm. I saw you at the very first Bassmaster Classic you were at, which I think was in Greenville, South Carolina, the year of the the ice storm. And um, I really watched you in particular and a couple of the other guys around you um, spend a lot of time networking and doing relationship building. And I think I mentioned it to you and you said, um, you know, for us being a part of this, the, the networking opportunity is, is every bit as important as the marketing impressions and being part of the thing. So that um, seems like a, was always an important tactic for you, which I was very impressed with. Um, but why was that such an important tactic for you? Yeah, I think there's, you know, at, at Under Armour during that time, I think every, every, a lot of people in the industry felt the same about the opportunity they were not capitalizing on. And, you know, uh, trade shows and some of those things over time, you know, we were perceived as being a little pretentious. 
yeah. um, because we're under armor, right? We're bigger yeah. than everybody in this building and we're doing fishing by accident and we're succeeding at it. So, ha. And we really wanted to take the opposite approach. Um, and, you know, having everyone on your team is really powerful. So whether it was, you know, being buddies with the, the GoPro guys and the Yeti guys and all of that, whether it's just a, you know, 15 minute touch base, how's your business, you know, what, what do you see coming down the pipe? You know, what, what's really going on here and, and really leaning on you guys hard for those intros. Mm-hmm. And, and what we were able to do is really create a, you know, kind of a, a, a groundswell and a, and a lot of fans, even within the industry. Um, and it, you know, it wasn't, wasn't by accident. It was very, very, um, you know, authentic on our part. Yeah. You know who we, we started the business with some of the greatest relationship guys in the world. Right. Um, but when you walked into ICAST four years later, almost every single company had their logo on a hook shirt. So yeah, if you came, that's right. If you're in fishing, you have to wear a hook. Yeah. And you know, those, the, the relationship building, you know, at the expo and at the center bar all night. And, you know, we just had a, a, a big old time of it the first couple of years and we made a lot of friends and, and a lot of contacts that, that, will last forever. And then, you know, we all help each other as we continue to go. So it's, you know, on a, on a monthly basis, I connect with probably 10 of those, those folks. Um, and you know, over the course of a year, it's, it's probably a hundred and mm-hmm. you know, you gotta keep it going. And there's always something, even though you haven't been speaking, you'll have a, a conversation like this and you're like, you know what, so-and-so could really like, can I make an intro for you? Yeah. And usually something will come out of it. Um, even if it's just a, an idea or, you know, just kind of challenge yourself a little bit and, and help them solve a problem. So it's that, I think that part of it and having the entire industry pulling for us was, was a really big deal. Well, I was just about to say, you know, I think a takeaway for people at home listening to this is we talk a lot about relationships on this podcast and how important they are in business. But I think more specifically, well, what you're what you're saying, what I hear you saying is uh, a takeaway for someone at home would be to create a network of people that want to see you succeed and want to help you succeed. And if you're humble and you go to them with a hum in a humble way and with, you know, with your heart on your sleeve, they'll want to help you to succeed most of the time. Absolutely. I think, yeah, especially in the outdoor space. I mean, humility is, is everything. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you want to be hungry. um, You know, you want to be humble. Anybody that worked at Under Armour will laugh because we had banners that hung up everywhere that said humble and hungry. Um, But, you know, that's really what you needed, especially in a, in a build your personal brand environment or in a startup environment. Like you got to be looking for, for every opportunity and every advantage um, and re- really be, you can be aggressive and, and be humble and, and still have everybody, you know, really love what you're doing. Um, you know, and I see some people in building their personal brand, they kind of, you know, go the pro wrestler route. Like here's the, who's the heel? Like, is this the guy nobody's going to like? Cause he's super brash and cocky. And, you know, sometimes you gotta be really good to, to, <laughs> to succeed with that, you know, <laughs> That's right. People I think that right now, but, um, you know, it, it's not for everybody. And, and most of our guys in this space are, you know, they, they, you know, have a, I grew up a, a simpler life mm-hmm. and were taught a lot of the right things. And, you know, had, had strict parents with, with rules in place and, and, you know, they understand how to go about it. So, you know, in the fishing space, there's not many that you come across that rub you the wrong way. And, you know, there's a reason for that. Cause they, they, they make it, uh, you know, kind of indirectly ushered out quickly. Right. Um, you know, if, if they're not delivering uh, performance on top of that attitude. That's so, right. That's you know, right. Humility and, and come with your hat in your hand and, and try to offer help whenever you can. And it'll, it'll come back to you for sure. I love that. So other than your brands that you're working on and the, you know, the, the, at that granular level, what lights you up in the business world right now? What's uh what's something going on that you can, that you get really excited about? Yeah, I think, especially right now, I do think there's a great opportunity for the outdoors in general. Okay. Um, Fishing and hunting have kind of been held uh, a little dramatic under siege, um, and, and I'm a victim of it or, or a proponent or participant in it. My kids' sports have gotten so specialized and so high pressure that I'm, you know, 10 hours, 15 hours a week on a field, there's literally no chance to get out. Mm-hmm. And by having a lot of these seasons canceled, I mean, I've got friends I never thought would have camped 
they're buying, you know, fifth wheel RVs, like they're in it, you know, they're, yeah. they're doing it. And it's the, the time that the dads get back in addition to the kids has allowed a lot of people to return to fishing. And I'm, I'm hoping that as we go through fall, you'll see that, um, on the, on the hunting side as well. I think it's a, you know, it's something that's, that's great. And a lot of people should know how to do it, but you know, the dads I talk to that don't hunt much anymore, they're like, look, man, I, my, I haven't been able to get my kid out because he's super busy, even though he's, you know, he's 13, but he's got a full schedule. And then I don't want to miss a game. Mm -hmm. So they haven't hunted in five years or they haven't really fished the way they wanted to. And, you know, I, I think this is going to be a nice little resurgence. Um, and, and hopefully we can build some of that base back, especially on the hunt side. I mean, it's, it's really been, um, you know, kind of dwindling down over time. And I just think it's opportunity. Yeah. And you know, the, the friends of my boys that, that we take, they, they love it and they continue to come, but, um, you know, it's really hard to find time for them. And mm -hmm. in a homeschool environment where sports are, are canceled, I know I, I would not hesitate to say that my kids have fished 150 days this year. Wow. Yeah. Golly, that's great. <laughs> so, and they do, you know, they do a hundred anyway, but here we are, it's August and they've already done 150. That's and, fantastic. um, whether it's, you know, the work you're, you're doing it virtual, so you don't have homework. And now we can, we can scoot out in the evening A fantastic babysitter takes fishing every day in the summer. Like they've, they've got it pretty good. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think some of that will really, really help everyone out. And that's, you know, that's more of a general in, industry uplift mm -hmm. that, that I'm hoping to see. And, you know, that, that's probably the most exciting thing I see right now is, you know, it's been a puzzle we've been trying to solve as an industry for a while. Um, so if you can, you know, pull the plug out of professional collegiate and recreational sports and people will always find something to do. Uh, I think it was really good. And, mm -hmm. you know, during this, this first couple of weeks of shutdown, every trail was packed with people to the point where they had to close the trails because yeah. we weren't social distancing. So it's, you know, thankfully we, we backed off of that and, and we're able to do it, but that's, you know, that's the silver lining for me in all this is like, how do we, how do we get back to the outdoors? Right. Right. I agree. Cause I, you know, not, I don't want to be sound uh, too corny, but to me, there's such great value in that time you spend, especially with your kids in the outdoors, because, you know, when I look back, you know, some of the most special times of my life were with my dad in a boat. And, um, and I can't even tell you what we talked about, you know, but I can tell you that when I see, when I drive by in my home town, when I drive by the cutoff to the lake, man, my heart just gets you know, because it was so special to me. Right. Right. Yeah. So hopefully a lot more people get, get to feel some of that and, and experience it. And you know, I know I've seen it. I just, you know, how, how can we hold on to it? And yeah, you know, it yeah. looks like we'll have some, some limited uh, sports for this fall. So hopefully we'll round the corner and, and go into 21 with a, you know, that, that renewed, you know, love and, and want to be outside. And, and I think, um, you know, if we can have a quarter of the people stick, Fantastic. Absolutely. 25% more people can work from home and can get out in the morning yeah. and not have to commute and not have to shower. Right. <laughs> job totally. done and make a living. That, even better. And yeah. uh, so hopefully this could be a, a great change for the outdoor business. That's right. I mean, I spend my morning time that I used to put on makeup outside on uh, exercising. So yeah. <laughs> it means a lot to me. All right. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with more with Ben Verner. Stay right with us. We'll be back. Hey, if you're enjoying this podcast, check out fishingbusinessschool.com where you can see video uploads of the podcast as well as my blog where I give you more practical advice on the business side of fishing. Fishingbusinessschool.com. Come see me over there. All right, we're back here on the Fishing Business Podcast with Ben Verner from Revolution and Critical Mass Brands. Uh, this is kind of my rapid fire uh, uh, segment here, oh, Ben. So um, what's the trait you, must li you most like about yourself? Uh, I was a very blue collar based athlete. Meaning like I wrestled and like I was the captain of every team, but I was never the best guy on the team. And it you was just playing like, polo. Yeah. Just no, <laughs> never, no quit. Yeah. Um, and just grind it out and kind of lead by that, by that oh, no quit I, example. I, and that's, I, I think you. that's, you know, wrestling is, is one of the most difficult things you could do. And you know, you, you don't, you learn a lot about yourself when you can't breathe <laughs> and there's only one way out and that's through your own, you know, fight. And, um, you know, in doing these startups and, and this level of business, I think it's been an absolute key. And 
I'll hire every wrestler right. that I get. <laughs> I think what you're saying, I, I've felt this way in my career before where I've been like, I may not be the smartest person in the world, the room or the most creative person in the room or, but I know and have a lot of confidence in my ability to work, to outwork somebody. And I don't mm-hmm. mind working hard. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully it's, okay. you know, working smarter, not harder, but I think it's the, it's the not quit. And, yeah. you know, we're talking a lot about, um, you know, some of these products in the first iteration of the invention and, and just continuing to, to work on it. And, you know, I think that's just one of those things that in this business is you have to, and yeah. you know, your defining product might be the 10th one you build. And yeah. you just don't know. What's the trait you most like to see in the people you work with, particularly when you were working with anglers, what was something that you, a trait of theirs that you, that you most liked? Um, you know, some of them are, are super fishy and some of them are super businessy. And the best ones do both. Ah. And, um, you know, where, you know, they, they will dedicate their time and they'll skip a dinner with you to work on tackle, but they'll get you somewhere else. And then, you know, they're really genuine with their time and, and really understand and, and kind of appreciate what you're trying to do. Um, and they always believed in what we were doing. And that was, you know, a key to our success. So I think mm-hmm. it's the, you know, they, they need to manage all aspects of their business. And, you know, some of the younger guys don't do that. They're still, really, you know, they're hungry for those trophies. Um, and you know, some of the older guys get it and you know, that's where, that's why the sponsorship dollars tend to flow that way is they, they really understand the business side of it. And through all the years of experience may have to prep a little less mm-hmm. <laughs> so they can focus on that. Yeah, but, that's true. Um, yeah, I, I, I love the grinders, um, and, and the guys that, that really appreciate kind of every crumb that falls their way mm-hmm. and, um, and they tend to capitalize on that over time and, and end up being, you know, some of the bigger guys. I love that. Um, who's somebody, a living person that you, that you most admire? Hmm. That's tough. Um, <laughs> I don't know, let's maybe come back to that one. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. What as a, I, this one, I should probably ask you your wife, but, um, what is your greatest extravagance? I like toys. So, and, it, and, you know, I'm, essentially made a career out of selling to myself or, or people like me. So, um, a new color of a product it's, you know, I don't have a full closet of, of apparel. Um, well, I do cause it's free, <laughs> but, but like any new bait, any new rod, you know, my kids play lacrosse. I'm constantly upgrading to the, the latest and greatest technology. And, um, you know, I think it helps on the, on the marketing side cause I know what triggers me mm-hmm. uh, able to find a way to do that. But yeah, it's, um, you know, it's, it's big trucks, it's the boats, it's, it's all the toys. It's, yeah. Um, I follow you um, on social media. I know, but I know I see your toys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. What's your current state of mind, Ben? Uh, right now I'm grinding, right? So we, we, a lot of the creative is done and now let's get to market. And, you know, a lot of the stuff is, is getting ready, being produced at the factory. It's on the water. Uh, it's prepared to launch time. So it's, it's really head down a lot of tasks, um, we've got four whiteboards in here that are just full of stuff to erase and cross off. So it's, it's the grind part of, of the cycle. Once we launch, then you start the creative part and, and, and it gets fun again. So and then, and then you <laughs> can't get have back one to without the, the other though. And then you get back to the grind part. That's right. <laughs> it's, it is a cycle. Hey, thanks so much for being here, Ben. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. I mean, it really means a lot to me. And uh, best of luck on all the things you've got going because you're, uh, you're a very, very talented, talented person. And it's going to be fun to watch what happens. Yeah, here we go. So thank you. I didn't okay. enjoy seeing your face again. It's been a while. <laughs> thanks, Ben. Boy, he's impressive. Didn't you think so? It's so great to hear the backstory of how Ben turned his passion into a mega business. And I hope that story inspires you. Here's my three key takeaways for you and me. Number one, be humble. Ben said the motto and lifestyle at Under Armour was to be humble and hungry. And he's taken that into his other businesses he's created. I already know you're hungry or you wouldn't be listening to this podcast, but I want to encourage you to be humble. You'll win people over to your cause if you're humble. And if you're humble and hungry, it will take you a long way towards number two, which is build a network of people who want to see you succeed. 
I think this encompasses a lot of people from your family and friends to competitors to partners and sponsors. Put some thought into how you can impress upon people that you're in it to win it and you will be successful one day and you want them to support you as you start out and that you're willing to put in the hard work to be successful both for yourself and for them. Build a network of people who want you to succeed and you will make your journey an easier one. But it's a two-way street. You work for them, so they'll help you. And finally, number three, don't give up before the third season. Now, Ben talked about this within the context of the retail process and how you're designing your products and plans for your next season before your first season is even at market yet. But I think it's true for fishing too. Don't give up before you really put the effort into making your passion a profitable business. And it takes a minute, y'all. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in a month or even a year usually. It takes hard work and commitment. And I believe you can do it. The other thing that Ben mentioned several times is just to get going, take action. And I can't agree more. We talked about getting out there to fail fast if something isn't going to work so you can learn from it and find what part of it does work. So if your dream is to turn your passion for fishing into a profitable business, one way you can take action today is by downloading my free workbook, Developing Your Personal Brand. You can find it at fishingbusinessschool.com slash brand workbook. I've got a link to it in the show notes. It will help you get started on creating a brand you can use to turn your passion into a profitable business. Okay, that's a wrap for this week's Fishing Business Podcast. Please be sure to rate and review the podcast on YouTube or your podcast platform. And I'll love you forever if you leave a nice comment. I'd really love to hear from you. I say this every week, and I'm not just saying it to hear myself talk. If you like what I'm doing here, I need your help to keep it going. And you can help by subscribing and reviewing the content so the algorithms know that you find it valuable. All right, I'm going to close out like I always do. And like Jerry McKinnis always closed his TV shows by saying this is dedicated to dad. He always had time to take me fishing. See you next time, y'all.